webinar specifically about how companies are leveraging um, are leveraging um, Mexico into their global supply chain strategy. Uh, we've got a full house today, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. And uh, we, I know we got a hard stop in one hour, and we got a lot to cover. Just on a point of housekeeping, for those companies, for those people who want to ask questions, please click on the question box. It'll come to me, and I'll ask the three speakers. Um, we're going to be taking questions throughout the whole slides, so please feel free to ask them. Um, we've got a full house today, so if you've got um, individual uh, questions you want to get to um, and we can't answer them, we'll get to you after the webinar. Okay, the, on slide two here, I just want to kind of cover with you kind of the introduction of how we're going to do this. We've got, um, we'll have a brief sketch on East, West and speakers. We're going to talk about why Mexico um, and then we're going to get into a discussion here. In order to address the question of how you best leverage Mexico in your global supply chain, we kind of broke it down into key points about why Mexico, what's the rationale for the, the, the reason why we're having this, this webinar, but the rationale for using Mexico and how do you how do you best leverage it? What are the current challenges they've got companies are having using Mexico? What's the future of the goals how to do it? We'd have a br very brief discussion on trade definitions for the USMCA, but I promise that this is not a compliance class, right? We're not, we're gonna very lightly hit it just so you understand the concept. And then we got three existing case studies of companies and how they have done it uh, and how they are how they are leveraging. As we start looking at uh, just a brief introduction of East West, um, East West is simply um, we're an operations consulting firm. We've got one qualification uh, for the people that work at East West, and that is they've all had to hold senior management positions. They had to have P&L responsibilities. They had to run Western companies on the ground in our five markets, right? Which is China, Southeast Asia, Mexico, Europe, and the U.S. But all of the people at East West have all had to build their own supply chain bases, develop supply chain strategies to service the global customers. Um, We've got, um, as you can see, we got four core services. The first is around corporate strategy for supply chain, corporate strategy for manufacturing. We've got um, an oftentimes used in developing that corporate strategy, to create a better uh, access to our client base through diversification of supply chain, through diversification of manufacturing. On the commercial side, that's related to what we're doing for companies on the top line growth. On the operational side, got all aspects of running and manufacturing operation, whether it is um, developing suppliers, qualifying suppliers, supplier improvement, but it's all about building out supplier strategies. We also build factories, move factories, have an executive search program, um, but it's all aspects, all operational aspects of running company. And then the final is risk management, and that's primarily our M&A practice and a supply chain risk management. Um, we have a team of ex-policemen, ex-military that do a lot of background checks on suppliers, because um, we have cases where companies will hire from a supplier and um, look, uh, several different suppliers and um, thinking they're all three, all in, these suppliers are all independent, only to find out that these suppliers are owned by one investor, one family. So we, those are our four core areas and, and the team we have come from a variety of companies here in the U.S., but they all had P&L responsibilities for running uh, their, their companies on the ground. Here's our core practice areas. Uh, but again, we're going to be focused today really about the strategic business planning and the supply chain optimization. Um, the core areas all dovetail into our areas of practice around corporate strategy, commercial development, operational, and risk management. Um, we have um, the areas of where we operate in the U.S. Uh, we operate in China, operating in Mexico, operating in Europe, and operating in Southeast Asia. And we do have uh, core practice areas. In, um, in several areas, particularly automotive and chemicals. So I will take now the time and I'm gonna introduce the different corporate speakers. The first speaker is gonna be uh, Stefan Lochner, Senior Automotive Specialist East West. Stefan, if you would take over. Yeah, thank you very much. As you heard, my name is Stefan Lochner. I'm, I'm German and with my engineering background, I was working for more than 30 years within or for the automotive industry. The last 22 years of that, um, I have my home base in Mexico, creating and executing manufacturing strategies for electronics, plastic injection, molding, and steel. Yeah. Um, 
and in with this i was building up plans uh, closing down plans uh, moving product to china from china to mexico so uh, vast experience in this area and with with this said i would like to hand over to dan hi this is dan mcleod i've been with east west for about four years now uh, doing projects in asia mexico and central europe in that time prior to that uh, spent majority of my career in operations management, manufacturing, uh, engineering project management, capital expansions, uh, primarily in the chemical industry, but also in food processing, a little bit of pharma, and some of the electronics industry. Uh, 21 years uh, in wor living and working in Asia, uh, 13 of that in China, the balance in Southeast Asia, uh, including uh, regional operations management as well as running factories uh, in Southeast Asia. <clears throat> Mark? Sure, thanks, Dan. So I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat similar. I've been with, uh, with East West about eight years now. Most of my career was in, uh, in Asia, uh, starting out in, in 1990 in Thailand with uh, American Standard Train Air Conditioning and then spinning up from, ni from 90 to roughly 2014, ending up as a president of Briggs & Stratton Asia out of Shanghai, uh, writing a, running a fairly large business. So good, good, really good understanding of running business, building and running businesses in Asia, and subsequently be based on the on the on the China situation changing a little bit. We've picked up a lot of projects and work and experience now in Central Eastern Europe and of course Mexico. So long, long time Asia hand. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you, Mark. Um, okay. Now we're going to look at kind of the question of why Mexico. So, Mark, I'm going to turn it over to you to kind of address sure, the Sure, sure, yeah, no, no, yeah. Next slide, please. So, I, I mean, everyone knows, I mean, who, uh, on this call has probably been in and around China for the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years. And well, what's what's been happening in the last three, four years? Well, we all know we, we went to China when labor rates were one thing in 1990. Now we have rising labor rates. Um, Next, next uh, bullet, please, Alex. And then, uh, and then, what's happened also is it, labor rates have been going up, growing regulatory complex, complexity. When we we first went to China, it was pretty easy to do business. It's gotten much more complicated. Uh, what's happened? We we uh, Western companies have put a lot of Chinese businesses in in competition with us by the fact of of lack of uh, of some uh, protections. Uh, with Xi Jinping is has really put up uh, a China 25 policy, really kind of by a kind of by China policy. That's been changing. Uh, now, what's happened re recently since uh, 2017 with the with the increased tariffs for, uh, coming from China to the USA has had a big impact. Uh, of course, COVID. What's that done? It, uh, it it's it's really stopped the ability for us to go to our to visit our companies, and do due diligence, introduce new products, do audits. Can't travel there uh, now. And, and most recently, a three thousand dollar container five years ago now is now a seventeen to twenty thousand dollar container. If you can get one in your times on the water, have gone from like six weeks to sixteen to twenty weeks. So the environment has changed dramatically in the last thirteen to fifteen years in in China. Uh, next slide, please. So, w w why Mexico? Well, particularly if 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 your business in China was to come back to the United States, it's it's really uh, its location is phenomenal. Location USA and North America markets, and then with the USMCA, really a large a large um, uh, free market. Uh, it's the growth of Mexico. Mexico was really strong, and then China sucked a lot of the business away 10, 15 years ago. Mexico is really coming back now because they see a tremendous opportunity that they have vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis what's what we just talked about is changing in China. Uh, the supply base is, is 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 getting better in areas. Now, it, guys will talk later. It's not in, in all aspects where China is, but uh, it's moving in the right direction, and being r right on our border gives it tremendous op tremendous advantages. Uh, the labor base uh, and skills, labor costs are at China or even a little bit less. Skills in some areas are as good. Skills in some areas, quite frankly, aren't as good. So you have to really work with your suppliers to get them up to your standards. Uh, next thing is we have a we have a we have a, a trade agreement. It's not it's not arbitrary. People just can't put duties on, take duties off, change this, change that. We have. We have trade agreements, you know, ratified by the by the U.S. Congress, so we you know what you're getting into, 
And, uh, and then of course it's in these trade agreements, if you do it correctly, and we're going to talk about that, uh, there's, you, you can, you can get away from all the tariffs coming in the 25% tariffs from the USA coming into, uh, pardon me, China coming into, to the USA. So, uh, anyways, I want to give, I'm going to turn this over to Dan now, and Dan's going to talk about really the rationale and the purpose of this webinar. Thanks, Mark. Sure. So, yes, so what, so what do we want to talk about today and why do we want to talk about it? Well, it, East West, we are talking a lot with customers, clients that are interested in evaluating their opportunities to make changes in their global supply chain, make changes in their manufacturing strategies, uh, really uh, revisit uh, decisions that were made years ago um, particularly around sourcing overseas and are looking at, at moving closer to home. You know, the big potential, as we mentioned, is you know, we talked a little bit about the, the increasing complexity and difficulty and challenges, challenges of working uh, in China, which drives a lot of it. But on the other side of the world, when you talk about logistics and time zone and travel restrictions, certainly the last few years. So getting closer to home, looking at Mexico, uh, as an option, particularly if your market's in, in North America, the U.S., and, and which is a key focus for um, most of the companies we talk to. What we find and in, in, in what uh, the reality is, is that many companies are going to be faced with continuing a relationship uh, and a supply base in China. And the challenge is, is to try to optimize that mix, what to uh, what to continue to source and produce in China uh, and what to uh, localize or regionalize uh, to serve uh, a North American market. Uh, this allows companies, if, if uh, done deftly, uh, it allows you to take advantage of an existing supplier base. The, the, the years of time you've put into developing your supplier base on the other side of the world, uh, but uh, reduce uh, I guess reduce uh, the reliance on that and build up a, a supplier base closer to home. Now the three major strategies that we talk with people about are one, the more basic approach to sourcing components or finished goods that's essentially local content uh, out of Mexico and it's for consumption in the US. And this could be uh, <clears throat> a lot, we talked to a lot of customers in the metals industries, for example, so castings, machine goods services, and machine, Parts, where you've got a well-established supplier base in Mexico and good technical capabilities. And so you're talking with somebody that can essentially move that, uh, sup that component supply from uh, overseas to Mexico. Um, then is sort of a, a hybrid model where you're looking at purchasing a, a finished product or a component that may have uh, local content from Mexico, but, but also imported content for China, from China and consumption in the U.S. So again, you've, you've developed a supplier base or you can't at this point find a, a supplier base capable uh, in North America. So you're, you're faced with having to continue some portion of that uh, imported from China or overseas, but want to maximize local content to take advantage of uh, the USMCA trade arrangements. Trade, uh, uh, arrangements. And at the same time, uh, reducing your logistics costs, your tariff costs, and your working capital exposure to have those long-term, long supply lines. And then the more, third, and finally, the more uh, complicated, uh, the more uh, time-consuming, the really the, the, the leaping into the, the deep end of the pool is the setting up subcontracting and manufacturing in Mexico, where you're utilizing local content uh, in terms of material, labor, utilities, space, factory overheads, logistics, transportation, in addition probably to imported components uh, from China and elsewhere. Uh, uh, again, this is a significant undertaking, but more and more companies are finding that, that this is a, a, an opportunity for them and, and are evaluating this as part of their supply chain. Um, it, it's, you've got, uh, certainly you've got advantages on logistics uh, responsiveness time in the marketplace, but you're faced with um, challenges of establishing a whole world operation still and the complexity associated with that. So those are three areas that we frequently talk to people. 
Hey, Dan, Dan uh, before we jump forward, we got uh, someone sent in a question. Uh, uh, individual is in the electronic sector, and they're talking about how they can, within Mexico, there's not a very fully established electronic sector. They've got them in, in, in PCBs, but he's, he, he said, you know, he, he's currently sources out of Asia, Southeast Asia, I'm assuming Thailand and Philippines, and, and he wants to know, what is, do we have any kind of thoughts or when do we see the electronic sector and this would be not for automotive electronics, but for uh, uh, for electronics like PCB board. When do when do they see a further development in Mexico of that industry? Do we have any thoughts on that? Um, I think it'll be a. I think for sort of basic electronic components that are. Uh, I, I think it'll be a long time before that's uh, developed in in North America and Mexico. Uh, the Industry is well established as far as consumer electronics, as you know, as far as building the devices. Uh, but they're going to continue to be a, a, a great deal of, uh, of the internals. For example, they're going to have to be imported. So you've got a you've got a well developed industry for putting everything together, uh, but it's still going to be uh, some time before you've got you can source all of the materials you need in North America. Having said that. Um, we talk with clients that are increasing their uh, component supplier base beyond China into Southeast Asia, Malaysia in particular. Uh, it gets a lot of discussion now to try to uh, try to uh, diversify the risk on that end. Uh, and we had uh, one other question, uh, this sector in the medical field, and can you or Stefan and Mark talk about this? They, are, they're, they, they currently source out of China uh, using subcontractors. Uh, for medical devices, uh, medical textile products. They're, they said they've had trouble finding the right suppliers in Mexico. Um, and you've talked a little bit about that, about the difficulty of it. But they want to know, is it setting up subcontracting in Mexico for them has been difficult. Can you all uh, speak to the, the challenges of doing that in Mexico versus this customer who's been in China for looks like eight, nine years? Can one of you all address that? Or all of you? The, yeah, one, the medicine, oh, sorry, Mark. No, no, go ahead, please, Stefan, please. Okay, um, we can see that in the, in the last years, I would say five years, more or less, uh, the medical sector increases in Mexico, the production of medical devices. Uh, but of course, uh, there was a, a drain about uh, 15 years ago uh, towards China. So it will take some time to bring this knowledge back to Mexico. Yeah, and, and all I was going to say is I think uh, you, in certain cases you need to really be prepared to work with uh, your new potential suppliers and, and bring them on. Uh, and and But that also then also can help endear you and get a strong relationship as you begin to bring some potential new suppliers on board. So it's uh, it's 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 a little bit of a of of a, of a teaching uh, and a working uh, methodology. Okay. All right. And I believe Stefan's up next, going to talk about challenges for companies. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah. And actually, the last question was quite a nice uh, lead to this <laughs> to this topic, because one of the challenges or the biggest challenge is that we have to overcome um, the, the immediate pressure of having simply good pricing from, from China or from anywhere else yeah, uh, versus establishing a long-term strategic solution. Yeah. Um, so which would require that uh, the experience in identifying qualifying stable and re reliable supply base, which has been cut off uh, and moved from Mexico to China uh, 20 years ago. Yeah, and uh, now the the real challenge is to to create uh, the relationship again with suppliers, um, and this is becoming more and more important. Yeah? Um, then we have to understand also the impact of using imported components and raw materials on our cost structure. Yeah, if we are moving uh, into Mexico, um, to be able to leverage 
uh, to use the the leverage of the rules of the USMCA and um, and the countries we are importing from. Yeah. And of course, to do this, we we have to understand the the culture and the business environment. Yeah. Um, when establishing operation or sub subcontracting relationships, yeah, it is not as fast as uh, China, for example, and this has to be this has to be taken into account. So, uh, with this said, I would like to hand over to Dan. If there is no question, yeah, there's Stefan. There is a question popped up. Okay. about yeah, you talked about and we've mentioned before around the difficulty of getting identifying quality uh, uh, manufactured quality suppliers on the ground in, in in Mexico, right? The difference between that and China. Um, and then now it's a challenge because everybody in the world, can you talk a little bit about, or all three of you will talk a little bit about why the challenge is so, so much more difficult in Mexico now to work with the suppliers than it was even pre-COVID? Uh, well, especially talking about uh, qualifying the suppliers um, if a whole uh, business was was pulled out of of mexico and moved to china many years ago i, I remember around 2000 uh, uh, ibm and hp moved all the electronics production from guadalajara to china um, this was uh, this was eliminating the possibility for mexico to to learn about these products and uh, understand um, the the business needs and the market. Um, now we we have to reteach again, yeah? and I see this very much reflected in the automotive business. Yeah? Uh, for everybody working in the automotive sector, it's it's very common to have certifications and to follow certain rules. Yeah, and now you you go to a supplier. In Mexico, uh, who does injection molding, and um, he says, "Yeah, I can do this product." Yeah, but you want some some specific documents from the guy, and and he simply does not know those. Yeah, and you 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 have to educate. Yeah, and it will take some time for the suppliers to accept again uh, requirements that were not present for for many years now. Uh, and this is one of the most uh, challenging um, situation because you have to find those who would go the way with you, yeah? and you you have to have the patience to do it. Does this? Yeah, we had a, a, we question. Can move on. We had just another question around. Um, uh, we, had, we had a couple of questions pop in, and again, it, for anyone who joined late, please send a question to us. We'll talk. But we've got a lot of people on today, so we may not get to every question. If we don't, we'll follow up with your question afterwards. But we just had a question pop in. One was about the content of products need to be sourced in Mexico for it to be deemed made in Mexico. And we're getting into that um, at, when we get to the case studies. Um, but someone was just talking about um, uh, specifically stainless steel fabrication, machining capabilities, and then one of uh, raw material availability for stainless steel and, and aluminum. Is that um, is there a pretty heavy availability of that in Mexico? Not built in Mexico, imported into Mexico, and I think we are covering this with the case studies as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, uh, we'll cover that here in just a minute. Yeah, so I would hand over to Dan. Then. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah, so you think about the goal for companies. Um, really, it's around developing a supply chain strategy that compares and balances a number of options. One, you look for stability. Uh, in the last two years, so many companies have had, it's been a day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day battle uh, facing disruptions, uh, you know, trying to schedule shipments, dealing with delays, dealing with uh, uh, power sh power shutdowns in China, dealing with travel restrictions, dealing with all the uh, variety of disruptions that are occurring. And so companies are looking for more stability, more predictability, more reliability. Um, the comparison of landed costs uh, and really a comprehensive comparison where it's, it's not just out the door price, 
uh, is becoming increasingly more common as, as the impact of freight, uh, as the impact of increased inventories and, and delays in shipments of forcing companies to put more working capital in has really changed the equation around uh, landed costs. Uh, de reducing dependence on China, and that could be in, whether it's a, a, a just a, a matter of good business of of having your eggs in multiple baskets, or whether there are serious geopolitical concerns. And we've certainly seen that in Europe in the last uh, several weeks, where supply chains have been disrupted by uh, conflict, and increasingly. Uh, uh, companies are concerned about a similar situation in Asia, and so bringing bringing sourcing and operations closer to home into the region is uh, makes a lot of sense from a longer term uh, ge ge geopolitical concerns. We mentioned live rising labor costs in China. That's going to continue to uh, Im impact operations there. In this contrast to North American labor rates, although there's been some certainly inflation in the last year. Uh, overall, labor rates in, in Mexico have been steady and predictable, and to the point where manufacturing labor costs are at or below what you see in, in the coastal, more developed areas of China. And, uh, and finally, you know, diversifying a supply chain base to ensure consistent supply of qual qualified raw materials. And then we talked a little bit about bringing those uh, suppliers closer to home up to speed, whether understanding your requirements or getting the appropriate certifications or qualifications uh, can be a, a challenge. But if you're in it for the long term, if you're in a long term game, uh, it can pay, definitely pay off at the end. So, uh, but, Stefan? Yeah, Dan, before you go, we got a, another question popped up. Um, it said the company is in the metals industry and they purchase castings and uh, forgings. They've had some success finding suppliers on the ground in Mexico, uh, but they want to know what are the relative quantity and capabilities of the raw material input suppliers in Mexico, like the steel mills and the smelters. Um, is there a trend, at least a, what's a future trend for primary and secondary metal suppliers in Mexico? Is that sector growing for, to be the casting well, and the forging sector? There's, there's certainly a lot of interest and uh, an area that's uh, been a challenge and we briefly started to touch upon it earlier is the amount of interest in uh, uh, companies like the source of Mexico and that's somewhat overwhelming uh, existing suppliers and, and creates a need to have a relationship with, with folks and what we're seeing is um, less interest in smaller quantities, shorter runs, and to the extent that uh, uh, you can move more volume to create some interest uh, in Mexico in your business is gonna be critical. Uh, suppliers are much more selective than they were a few years ago. And, and Stefan, you may also wanna comment on that as well as what you've seen there. And they, they, they and, and, and also you can comment a little bit about the, the the basis right now of just having of, of the of the castings and the forgings and and particularly in the the, the steel and, and and metal sector, um, what the growth of that looks like. Yeah, this the steel mill sector itself uh, is is not in a vast growth. We have to say because there was a um, a worldwide overcapacity and. Uh, we were basically swamped by by steel from from anywhere, yeah. And um, this is not right now um, one of the the primary sectors that's that's growing. The secondary, yes, yeah. Uh, meaning um, you have you have service centers laminating uh, steel. Um, you have. Uh, Business uh, that are starting a lot of business that is uh, starting with stamping and and casting and and all these things, um, but those are being developed based on the business sector they are working for. You have it well developed for for the automotive se sector, for example. You have a lot of casting of uh, for the engine. Uh, 
um, components, for example. Yeah, but uh, everything that's that's more related to lower volume is suffering so far. Right, and 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 is there, and, and that's primarily on a, uh, that's primarily on a. Uh, we think for the next two to three years, that's going to be about that's that situation is going to remain. Yes. Yes, for sure, because those are those are um, long term investments, yeah. And uh, since Mexico does not have the market yet uh, to supply into other business sectors than the high volume automotive, uh, a little bit into the into the um, aviation sector so far and appliances, but uh, anything else but but those three areas um, do not uh, support uh, creating new supply bases for um, especially in the steel sector. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, they, 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 uh, all right. We'll now turn over the trade definition before we get the case studies. And again, just a reminder, we're, this is not, we're not going to go deep on the trade definitions. It's not a compliance test. The, the audience that's here needs to know the basics. So, Stefan, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so, yeah, this is, this is actually, um, a little bit related to the last question, yeah, on the supply base and steel sector. Uh, we now talk about how to work around yeah, because we have to import material, and um, we will we will shortly talk about uh, prosec rules of origin, uh, regional content value, the methods how to calculate, and I will give you a summary just to understand. Um, how the case studies work out. Yeah? It's as Alex said, no compliance training. Yeah, it's just to provide an overview. <laughs> so, so ProSec uh, means uh, promoted sectors. Yeah? Um, ProSec allows companies um, to import uh, material or components for, uh, at preferential duties, which is normally zero percent if they are working or supplying to specific promoted sectors in Mexico. Yeah? And this, of course, only applies for imports into Mexico. Yeah? And currently we have 24 of those industry sectors that are being promoted, um, under which steel, automotive, chemicals and electronics are, are the most prominent ones, yeah? um, which also answers part of the question which ones they want to de want to develop but do not see the supply base yet to do everything within Mexico yeah? um, and just as an example yeah uh, we can import uh, Chinese auto components into the US and then we possibly face uh, US China tariffs. Yeah? We use the same Chinese auto component and import it into Mexico uh, because it's an auto component. You are probably not paying any duty or tariff yeah, due to the Prosec, but it only applies if we add some additional value to it within Mexico in this sector or if we build it into a car directly in Mexico. Yeah. Um, then the rules of origin, it's the concept that governs uh, uh, USMCA, which is permitting the duty-free trade of products that originate within US, Mexico or Canada. Yeah? And uh, this contract has product-specific rules yeah, um, to determine which or whether a particular product meets the requirements of originating. Yeah. Um, and the whole purpose of, of the USMCA and the rules of origin is to encourage more trade between the USMCA countries yeah, under specific rules. Next page, please. Uh, Seba, before you go on, we had another question and it kind of okay. dovetails into this whole conversation around okay. trade within the US and Mexico. It was talking about, um, um, are you, for you and Dan and Mark about, they're asking logistics. They, they, they just got quoted uh, some freight rate 
from Mexico to the U.S. It was uh, they said it was eight thousand dollars from the border currently, which seems to me excessively high. But but for you and Mark, that where do you all see kind of the freight rates coming from Mexico, getting up to the border? The, uh, are the Mexican freight rates? I mean, they were increasing last year. Do, are those going to uh, level out? Where do you where do you all see that? The last the last evaluations uh, I did for some of my customers were that the freight rates uh, are stabilizing at a very high level compared to previous years, and this is mainly related now to the gas prices, yeah, um, and to the um, increased demand on on freight. Yeah? So the uh, market is pulling much more freight than could be managed right now mm. yeah. there's a yeah, there's an imbalance of trailers going into mexico versus coming out for years it was a fair in general balance and now there's a substantial shift so that uh logistics companies are forced to send a lot of empty trailers back into back there to, to pick up loads and that adds to the cost as well yeah, and that uh, makes, makes good sense. Uh, uh, and th that's probably not going to change for the foreseeable future, although it's nowhere near what, what's uh, still obviously vastly preferable costs coming out of China. Yeah, yeah and, um, and my, my personal opinion is, uh, my personal experience is, if you have uh, a, a use contract with, uh, with I don't know how many um, travels between a plant and the border yeah, and a certain volume you are managing uh, you usually get uh, very good prices yeah if it's if it's calculable but if you are um, asking uh, let's say a, a type of spot buy of of freight yeah then you are exposed to to prices that are that might be 10 times higher than than um, the long term pricing yeah yeah, agreed, agreed, and we've seen that that ourselves, yeah. Okay, I will move on with a regional content yeah. value, yeah? That is a term describing whether a product qualifies for the trade benefits under USMCA, USMCA. And, and that's basically the percentage of, uh, of uh, product value that is required for regional con content. Um, the, the regional content value differs significantly uh, depending on the end product usage. We will see this clearly in our case studies. Yeah? And um, for example, for more protected industry sectors, and now looking into the US, um, the US is protecting automotive um, steel chemicals and others yeah and there we have a, a higher requ uh, request on regional content value yeah just to protect against significant import yeah and for the less protected industry sectors like appliances the that allows for for lower regional content value for example um, now the transaction value method and the net cost method, those are two calculation methods that are used to determine um, if a product, uh, a particular product meets the regional content value. Yeah. And that's uh, basically calculating the percentage of the regional content. Yeah. Um, and Again, repeating, this webinar is not a class on compliance training, <laughs> yeah. but we need to know the basics to understand. Um, and uh, so we can determine how it will affect our supply chain strategy yeah, and cost structure. Yeah. The net cost method evaluates the percentages of originating material yeah, uh, used to produce um, your goods and the transaction value method leaves a little bit more freedom because 
some more costs can be added and uh, um, increase potentially the regional content. Yeah. But the net cost value, the net cost method is applicable to every calculation we do. The transaction value method is only applicable to certain um, business sectors. So let's go to the summary. Um, the USMCA allows the free trade of goods yeah, between the three countries yeah, um, if produced there. Yeah. Um, second, there are various exemptions to these basic rules yeah, for protected industry sectors like automotive, automotive electronics, steel, oil, gas, chemicals, etc. Yeah. So we have to look into it case by case. Yeah. Um, a workaround for uh, business sectors that do not have a supply base established in Mexico is PROSEC, yeah, which allows companies to import goods and materials into Mexico from any country in the world, yeah, often with a 0% duty. And uh, even if the goods are being assembled with imported components, there are possibilities to trade them tax-free between the USMCA countries. And this is related to the regional content. And some industries are more protected than others and um, imported product will have a, a varying um, tariff code depending on the industry sector you're using the product at. This is to give the, the um, tax authorities uh, a hint how much tax should be paid on this product. Okay, and with this said, I would hand over to Mark to do the first case sure. study. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. So, yeah, we're going to uh, we're going to go through three case studies, and uh, we're going to kind of demonstrate what we've done, where it 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 where your industry and your application can change the same product to a different duty structure depending on how it's used. Uh, next slide, please, Alex. Yeah, and Mark, before we go, just a real quick question. It kind of dubbed it. Just got a question in. It said, in the absence of smaller quantities of basic steel in Mexico, it's pretty straightforward to source steel in the U.S. and send it down to Mexico. Is that that, that is that has not been an issue? Obviously, well, that's, that's right. And, and, and that and that's frankly, you'll see our the, our first basic case study that we've done was just that. As, as Stefan said, the, the steel industry is is a global industry. And and it's the capacity is is huge. So you don't need to have to have a steel mill ne next to every place you're, where you're producing, right? So in this case, uh, we had clients who were 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 bringing steel tubes in, you know, from the from the China into the USA and paying the duties. You take those same steel tubes now and and uh, and, and and have them, you know, shipped from the USA into <clears throat> into Mexico or find them in Mexico where the application has already been done, you've got 100% local regional content, you know, whether it's USA, Canada, Mexico. So uh, again, that's, and then you, then you begin to fabricate and however you want to. So that one's a, a pretty basic straight um, uh, moving, uh, moving a source component or, or a, uh, or a raw material from, from China to, to, to Mexico and, and be able to avoid the 25% tariffs. So Dan's, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Stefan's going to talk next about uh, about another case study that's a little more complicated using the same steel tube uh, thought process. Stefan? Maybe yep. before we jump forward, another question popped in that said, when we're talking about tax-free, does that mean that, um, that the, the U.S. importers don't pay the, the VAT taxes between the U.S. and, and Mexico and Canada? Um, if, if, if you're if you're sending in this case more for producing um, tubes down in Mexico and then sending them to the U.S., there's no VAT tax that you've got to pay on that 
under the U.S. Code well, that it's allowed. Yeah, I mean the, the main tax we were talking about the tariffs, of course, was from China, you know, to to uh, to, to USA, and then on the VAT, depending on the industry, you you, you typically you draw that back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you. Sure. Yeah. Just, All right. Yeah. Now, if we move to the next slide, yeah, um, let's look into the same product, yeah, steel tubes that are being produced, stainless steel tubes that are being produced in Mexico. And we use this uh, knowing that you would ask for it, I think. Um, the, the material uh, is not available in Mexico. Yeah, there is no producer of stainless steel in Mexico. Um, we have uh, modification of stainless steel in Mexico, but, but uh, like rolling it into uh, or laminating the steel and so on, but but not producing it. So it has to come from somewhere. And in, in this case, we just said it comes from China or, or Korea, South Korea, wherever. Yeah. And we import it under Prosec. Yeah. Because we are working in the in the steel industry or in the automotive or whatsoever. Yeah. But steel is driving here. And we can import with zero percent duties uh, into Mexico. Then we add a uh, value. And if we look into the blue box, yeah, um, we just took the assumption 35 percent of our cost is the material without transport and anything. It's only the material. Um, and 65 percent we add as value. Um, now, look, going back into the into the USMCA um, rules. Um, if we look into the rules for appliances, we need to comply with fifty percent uh, regional content of the product, and with the sixty-five percent we reached, we comply with all the rules to import from Mexico to the US tax-free. Um, and just to give you an information about the, the um, numbers I put behind the sentences, um, these numbers are the tariff codes which are being used to import um, into the US these specific steels yeah? or uh, steel tubes. So for appliance, 50% no tax uh, to be paid. Um, then we look into the automotive aftermarket for exhaust systems, muffler, for example. We have a specific steel tube used for muffler, um, and uh, we have to reach 50% 50, uh, 50 um, regional content. We have 65, so we do not pay any tax moving it from Mexico to the US. Um, we are using the same tube for the heavy truck industry, yeah? and we have to reach 60% regional content. With our 65, we are done, no tax applies. Yeah? We can use the same tube specifically for the oil and gas industry, yeah? and we have to have a 65% regional content already. We have it. So we pay no tax, yeah. but then we are selling it to the automotive industry in the USA um, for passenger car use, but not for chassis. Yeah. There we have to have a 70% local content and we only have 65. So this one would not um, comply with, uh, with the regional content necessary um, to be imported without tax. And for the chassis use of the same passenger car, the same tube would even need 75% regional content. So the takeaway here is the exactly the same tube can have different tariff, tariff codes. And this depends on the industry sector you're using the product in. Yeah. And with this said, uh, to have another example 
in the electronics business, I would like to hand over to Dan. Thanks, Stephen. So, you know, we want to talk a bit about the electronics sector, uh, where you know we've seen a number of challenges, and, and as I think we talked about earlier, much of the componentry, the key components used in uh, electronic equipment devices, are still based in Asia and China as a, as a strong, broad, and deep supply chain basis. And uh, many, many manufacturers are going to be faced with having to continue to source from that geography for several years to come until you see more growth of a regional uh, manufacturing supply chain. Well, that's not all lost, but you need to carefully look at the value add and, and your your manufacturing processes. So uh, if you look at an, an example uh, that we've chosen here, we would assume that uh, we're looking at a 35% imported uh, component and uh, complete the manufacturing. Uh, it could be labor, could be other materials sourced uh, within Mexico, uh, the utilities, uh, your factory overheads and expenses. And so we're maintaining a 35% import, import component, 65% local. Uh, so again, similar to the case we talked about previously on stainless steel tubes, you've got different requirements for different uh, different end markets. Uh, for industrial use, uh, you can import and use tariff-free. Consumer electronics, that hurdles closer to 40%, somewhat higher, but still very manageable in most cases. Uh, for a bus, uh, uh, lower 60%, and passenger cars currently 67.5%. So that's quite a hurdle rate, right? and we require you to uh, source more and put more value in domestically. And uh, comment on that, that's a that's a transitional rate where two years ago that was 60%, and that's moving to 75% in the next year. So again, it's going to force more and more uh, uh, assembly work and local sourcing and components to be able to comply with uh, U.S. Uh, MCA requirements. So it's very much, again, a, uh, a focus on which sector and understanding which sector you're selling into and what the application is. With that, uh, Alex, I'll turn it over to you to wrap up. All right. So before we do, we got a couple questions that popped in. Uh, uh, on that last one, the, the, the question was on the for the protected industries on electronics, right? You've got um, electronic like for automotives. The, the, those are going to be more protected. Less protected are going to be like consumer electronics. That'd be fair. Stefan, I think that's a uh, yes. That that's pretty fair. Sorry, so. I was on mute. I was on mute. I, I answered yes, but nobody heard me. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a fair fair statement. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the, the the point here, and we're gonna as, as we wrap up here, there was the the, the point of looking at this is is that uh, there are just kind of several core, core conclusions we just want to address. One is that obviously why Mexico we talked about earlier, given everything that's going on in China uh, with the travel restrictions, labor costs, logistical costs, we know what's going on in just recently in Shanghai and Shenzhen uh, where they've had. Um, further lockdowns because of COVID, uh, it's making China a much more difficult place to operate. And in addition to all the other things that have occurred um, in the, previously, and, and we now know that we've had some rolling blackouts in China. Given that situation, in China, we don't see companies leaving China. They're going to keep that diversification there, keep that client base there, the list of customers. But they are diversifying into other places, and Mexico is a prime one uh, because of the location here, right? And when they're diversifying their global supply chain, the manufacturing here better service their customers in the U.S. North America. The 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 what we're seeing those that are doing it more successfully um, of coming and diversifying the supply chain from into Mexico, they're doing a couple of things. One is it's it's not just going out and finding products in Mexico and here. They're trying to establish see if there's real a real availability of Mexican supply chain base. Um, and Mexico is not China, right? Uh, we got a question that just popped up here around how does Mexico compare to China as far as the the breadth of logistics, as far as the ports, um, as far as the just the varied base of it. 
Um, and, and, and Mexico is not China. Mexico is about 250 million people. China is a billion four. Um, there are parts of the Mexican economy talking about automotive, electronics, medical, um, fabrication, where Mexico has done very well and is really strong in the areas. There are other areas where when we've done sourcing, our Mexican team was sourced, they're not going to find products nearly as competitive uh, in Mexico compared to China, just because they don't have the depth and the breadth of product that has been needed in the past. Um, but there are, but Mexico is making some improvements. So Mexico is a fit, but it's not a perfect, it's not a replacement for China. Um, however, what they are doing is they are, the, the USMCA does help both the U.S. and um, suppliers and U.S. manufacturing companies because it does, in a lot of cases, it allows companies who have an established supply chain in China to bring products into Mexico with no duties, right? And then have it, have the value added, add on to Mexico, produce some Mexican content or U.S. content. Um, and that's a pretty significant thing. So it allows you to diversify and still bring in uh, imported products from China um, as part of uh, as part of your regional content value. Um, you can bring them in. You've got better, obviously, logistical costs coming up from Mexico, and the USMCA is helping that. So we see companies taking kind of a more holistic approach to, to looking at Mexico and evaluating their total supply chain. And Dan spoke on it earlier about logistics costs and the cost of, of there's a cost of having freight on the water coming in from China. Companies are now taking a much more holistic approach. Um, before I go forward to the next, to the final two, um, um, there was another question that popped up just talking about the the the, the labor rates in Mexico. Um, and if if any if Dan or Mark or Stefan, if you all see those labor rates increasing substantially, like they have been in China, or do you think it's gonna it, it the Mexico labor rate is a pretty consistent because uh, that's obviously gonna affect the price coming out of Mexico. Mexico, Mexican labor rate is very consistent if we are looking on a US dollar base yeah, because usually the the increases are, are outweighed by by inflation in Mexico um, on the peso so uh, we see a very very moderate uh, growth or even uh, in some years decline of the labor rate yeah, yeah. Yeah, a major difference is, as you know, Mexico is market driven on their wages and China yeah. is top down mandated driven. It's like a lot of the communist countries are. Yeah, fair point. OK, well, thank you all for answering that. Uh, and the final two points we wanted to leave you all with was um, one of the companies which are sourcing a product produced in Mexico with Mexican content that we talked earlier about the stainless steel. They're comparing that to their current suppliers in China. Right. So they're basically bringing product in. Uh, from, from Mexico, comparing it with China. The issue there is really it's a tough sourcing environment in Mexico because their the potential suppliers are, are overloaded um, with requests and Mexico is not China. It doesn't have uh, the supply chain base at all. Um, so, and the last final point is that companies which are sourcing products from Mexico that have imported products have got to go a little deeper, look at their cost structure. We're doing a lot of reports like that for our clients now so that they can compare their costs in Mexico versus their costs in China as part of a kind of a global supply chain strategy. Um, we are now um, at uh, 12 o'clock uh, that we had a hard sub at one hour. For the, question, the questions we did not get to, we will get to you after the webinar. And we want to thank you all very much for participating. So with that, we'll sign off and I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.